Hey, we're here with Ryan and Richie from Warpstream Labs, who recently launched their company. The first thing I want to know, I've worked at a couple companies. I've had coworkers. No one's wanted to start a company with me, and yet you two have figured it out. What's that? What's going on? We can unpack my issues, but what's the origin tale? Like, was it over lunch? Was it over Google Hangout? When did you two figure this out that uh, this was the team that you were going to start a company with? Because I'm taking notes for my own personal life. I'm going to disappoint you a little bit uh, because Ryan and I started a company. Well, we tried, I don't know. Yeah, started a company. It was, it was a, a very short lived company uh, before we joined Datadog together. So we had already worked together going into Datadog. Um, so, got it. So, I'm wait, wait, wait. No, you got to tell that story because it's a good one. You got to, you got to like pitch it as like the world's shortest uh, aqua hire process. Okay, I'll let, you, I'll let you go. Yeah, so to to rewind a little bit before that, uh, I met Richie at uh, Percona Live 2019 in Austin, Texas, and I was giving a talk about Foundation DB, and I think you were giving a talk about about M3DB. Yeah, he was giving a talk about M3DB. I went to his talk. He did not come to my talk. That's true. <laughs> okay. um, but anyway, Richie came up uh, after the after my talk and asked me some questions and we got to, to talking about um, foundation DB. And I basically said that M3 was bad. I didn't think it was a good database. And uh, I guess maybe that caught his interest. And we, we kept talking after that and I pitched him on a couple of ideas um, after the conference about things that we could work on together. One of them was what eventually became Warpstream that he found very uninteresting. Mm -hmm. at the time um i was like kafka who cares about kafka? who cares about kafka yeah um, actually yeah the other one was basically replacing elasticsearch with a columnar database built on top of s3 designed specifically for observability data and that's the thing that he found much more interesting so we we started working on a prototype of of that together um and eventually we had some offers to take uh, seed financing or we had through a very weird set of circumstances an offer to basically get acquired by Datadog and go build our, you know, take our crappy prototype and put it into production at, at Datadog. We didn't literally do that. Obviously it was completely yeah. from scratch with a, with a, a team of other folks at, at Datadog. But once we finished, you know, doing that, you know, that took, that's, you know, fast forwarding another three and a half years after doing the, the migration to, to Husky, Richie found the problem of Kafka a lot more interesting because that's like the beginning of the data pipelines at, at Datadog. Um, you got to experience the pain firsthand and thinks it's a much more interesting problem now. Once I started getting paged, you know, you're like, all right, this, this problem needs to be solved now. Um, so uh, when we were at Uber on M3, we, we didn't use Kafka for, for metrics data. I worked on the metrics team. I think, actually not even sure if the logging team did at the time I was there. Um, and I think neither of us, if they did, it was, like well, for only some of it. And the reason we didn't use it at all for metrics was just cost. I think we, at one point, someone had done a calculation. Someone on our team wrote an RFC to do something that looked like Kafka. It's called M3 Message. I think it's open source. And it was basically like in memory queues. So if you think about like Kafka, but without the writing to disk part, um, but with like message acknowledgement between machines, um, because, you know, sometimes when we did an unclean shutdown, we'd lose some messages in the kernel TCP buffers or whatever. And when we did that, someone wanted us to look at like using Kafka instead of making this, you know, weird in-memory messaging thing. And I think the we did the math for how many Kafka brokers we need. And it was like, yeah, like 800 Kafka brokers. And we we're like, no, we're not, we're not doing that. So, um, so it wasn't until Datadog that kind of really saw the, the need for something better there. So Ryan, this has been the master plan all along, is what I'm gathering. Yeah, that I, I at least a little bit. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I had some ideas on how to 
do this a long, a long time ago. Then the, the pieces didn't all click together until we started working on uh, Warpstream once we both left Datadog. You know, we got everything to kind of click about how to make it work end to end. But yeah, the high level idea I'm thinking about for a long time. Okay, so I'm obviously, uh, Aji, I know you probably have a question. I don't think we've even described yet what company you all are uh, talking about or what your product is. So I probably feel like that would make sense to do a quick 30 second here. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. Warpstream, the company is Warpstream Labs. The product is Warpstream. It is a Kafka protocol compatible data streaming system that runs directly on top of object storage. So the way I usually kind of pitch it and explain it is that it looks and behave, ex behaves exactly like a Kafka cluster, but internally the implementation is completely different. Um, and so the way that you know our customers use the product and deploy it is we give them a stateless Go binary that they just put in their cloud account and point at an object storage bucket in their cloud account. Um, and you know, out the other side basically pops the Kafka protocol. Um, and the big benefits there are there's no local disks basically anywhere in the stack. So if you're a company that wants to do some data streaming stuff or you have high volume workloads and you know you don't want to have a team of nine people managing your Kafka clusters and figuring out how to rebalance partitions and replace failing brokers and dealing with like unclean leader elections and all that type of stuff. Um, you get this thing that basically is as simple to run as Nginx, all the kind of hard problems around like scaling storage, durability, availability of storage are kind of offloaded to the object storage provider in your cloud. So if you're an Amazon, it's S3. Um, the other big part of it too, is that for these really high volume workloads, like the ones that we've been working on for the last, you know, seven, eight years of our careers around like high volume metrics, high volume logs, telemetry, um, IoT data, all that type of stuff. Um, when you run like kind of a traditional Kafka cluster, replicated Kafka cluster in a cloud environment, and you know, you're replicating the data across three availability zones so you can survive the loss of an availability zone uh, while maintaining all your durability and consistency guarantees. Uh, like 90% of your costs, 80 to 90%, depending, of the cost of that workload will just be paying your cloud provider to copy data from one availability zone to the other. Every time you do that, you have to pay two cents, one cent for egress from the availability zone that you're in, and then one cent per gigabyte for ingress into the availability zone that you're transferring data into. And if you're, you know, for every gigabyte of data you have to write through Kafka, it has to, it goes to a leader, which is in like the wrong zone, quote unquote, from the producer two thirds of the time. And then it has to be copied to followers in two other zones. So you're paying like 5.3 cents per gigabyte of data written, um, you know, which is cents. It doesn't sound like a lot, but if you're streaming a gigabyte or two per second, it, it adds up really quickly. Um, can easily get into the millions of dollars per year just paying for networking fees. Um, yeah, I've networking. seen that's like the plot of Office Space where they. The surrounding areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We okay. regularly talk to customers about their Kafka workloads that would be spending like, yeah, millions of dollars a year on yeah. this specific line item of their Amazon bill. Um, and it's really hard to attribute it. It's like super annoying because like, if you go to talk to someone, you're like, how many Kafka brokers do you have? They're like, I know exactly how many because I had to replace one yesterday, right? It's like 25. Um, but then you're like, okay, but how much do you spend on interzone networking? It's like really hard to go from like your Amazon bill to attribute the networking back to like your Kafka brokers, but it can end up being like, it's like you're paying for 200 brokers, like, you know, logically, like how much you're paying for it, but you just like, it's not attributed properly, so. Yeah, and the the trick basically with Warpstream is that bandwidth between EC2, I mean, it's the, the same in the other cloud providers more or less, but just talking about Amazon, bandwidth between EC2 and S3 is free when you're going within the same region. Um, it's the same reason why Snowflake's business model works at all, because they can transfer data from their data warehouse compute nodes to S3 and back for free. Um, and Warpstream takes advantage of the same the same idea there, basically. This all sounds hard, guys. I'm glad I'm glad you've taken on the work of doing the hard stuff so that we don't have to. But that's actually kind of why I wanted you guys to come onto the podcast because I feel like this kind of large scale data processing is like the final level of all 
things that you learn in kind of at least systems oriented computer science. It's like you need to understand networking. You need to understand well how the machine works firstly, but everything, all the abstractions you're working through, the the hypervisor, the VMs, thing. Through to you're talking about uh, achieving consensus, like the distributed systems concept. So I I feel like I mean many listeners probably know Richie already from a previous uh, uh, podcast where we spoke about his like early trajectory from boot camp to working on I think at that stage you were just working on M3 Richie you were you were still at Uber uh, and then you know and M- M3 was a very large scale data processing system but then to go on and build Husky and now Warpstream as well you, you know it's another very ambitious large scale data processing system um what do you feel like well firstly I want to point out like not a lot of people realize that there there are people in the industry who started in boot camps novel work like from scratch first principles work at the at the most challenging level so like firstly richie i want you to like stand up represent make sure <laughs> make sure people know it's not just coming from like mit and stanford and uh you know it's not it's not just like the traditional way that we expect people to get to that that We're point uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, don't know. I don't actually know Ryan's background. So <laughs> I'm not disparaging yeah, right. the MIT and Stanford people, just in case. <laughs> I went uh, to but, Purdue, but I don't have a computer science degree. Yeah, I, so I was going to bring that up. Oh, you don't either. Okay. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's that's uh, on brand then. Uh, <laughs> I mean, obviously, like these computer science programs are fantastic. And, uh, you know, if people know at the age of 18 that that's what they want to do and they can get into MIT, like that's fantastic. They should do that too. But like, I don't, I don't think there's a, an appreciation of the different paths that people can take to doing this kind of work. And I know in the community of self-taught and non-traditionally educated software engineers, that there's a lot of aspiration to do the kind of things that you guys do and, and not so much of a, a narrative out there of like, okay, how do I break out of routine web development? You know, how do I work on larger scale systems, whether it's for someone else or like eventually how could I imagine building a system from scratch, designing a system like this myself? Could you guys give us all some insight into like what are the core things that you had to come to understand or the core steps that you took as part of this, as part of this process? So so I wrote, a, I think I wrote a blog post about this not too long ago. Um, that a lot of people, I think it resonated with a lot of people. Um, I think, you know, you're a little bit biased here, obviously, Oz, but like, and I think uh, for good reason, um, I consider like, you know, a lot of the, I attribute a lot of my success to basically two things. One is being around really other really good engineers and having mentors, um, especially like you and Miles early on in my career and all the classes I took at Bradfield. And the other thing I'll say too, though, is just like that core CS knowledge, it just like, it just, you can't escape it. You have to know a lot of it. Um, That's one thing I still surprises me sometimes. Like I I work with a lot of people. I've worked with a lot of people who have CS degrees and still seem to be like missing a lot of the stuff that, you're supposed to learn in school um and so can you unpack some of that like or can you give a couple of examples of like what is the thing you're expected to know in school that you know how garbage collector works like the basic fundamental principles of like at datadog there were a lot of people writing some fairly like working on services that were fairly high throughput um and scale in garbage collected languages that i don't think knew maybe even like the basic algorithm the different types of, like, not even the algorithm that their love programming language they were writing in is using, let alone, like, all the other different possible ones and what trade-offs they make and how to, like, because, like, the inevitable conclusion you want to reach to is, like, okay, I understand how garbage collection works. I understand how the specific garbage collection work collector works. And now I know how to structure my code to play nicely with the garbage collector instead of getting in its way, right? That's, like, the kind of the final play. And then, and now I have really fast and efficient software that, saves money in trees or, you know, whatever it is you care about. Um, but like, that's like a class that you, you know, I would expect that you would have taken in a computer science class and is like extremely relevant um, to the type of work that we do, right? Like almost all of our code is written like with some conscientiousness towards the, the garbage collector. Yeah. 
Um, so I like you just can't escape the core is fundamental. And it, I think that's why Brian and I have always gravitated towards distributed storage, because you're right, it's it's kernels, it's operating systems, it's networking, it's hardware, it's um, algorithms, it's data structures, it's garbage collection, it's all there. And it all has to kind of play together harmoniously or the system just like won't work. Um, but I the, the other thing I'll just add to you, because I've talked about this a lot before, is just that um, I think part of the reason Ryan and I initially got along early, like you, like you have a business degree. I think he got his first job. Didn't you like find someone's website was slow and you sent them an email and you're like, if you fix all this JavaScript stuff on your website, it'll be faster. Isn't that how you got into your yeah, first not, job? Not, it wasn't my literal first job, but yeah, the, the, one of my earlier jobs was essentially a cold email to do like front end performance optimization for, uh, like a low code WYSIWYG website builder yeah. company. So like it, they were, you know, at reasonable scale with lots of websites, but I was just like, all of your websites are slow because of their, they have this flaw. So how did you get from that to like becoming the, I like to joke that he was the world's uh, best and only foundation UV consultant. Uh, so how did you get from, you know, telling people their websites are slow to that? Um, I had, while I was working uh, at that job, one of the, tasks that I had to solve was making their the a part of the website builder software was also like you could sell products and like send emails and stuff. It's like an integrated marketing solution. And one of the features was it would uh you could send emails or do other actions based on things that people previously did. So like if you bought this product, you opened this email and like you opened a link from this text message, like, a, you know, you know, some arbitrary set of rules, you could send other emails or do other actions um, for those customers. I think like the generic term is called marketing automation. Like that's what the, the industry term is for it. And they were running that on a gigantic Amazon Aurora database. They just had one big Amazon Aurora database that, um, some background job in Ruby would query to generate the reports of which emails to send based on those rules. And the, the email reports were like perpetually falling behind for the largest customers because they were just a gigantic SQL query that they sent to Aurora. So I had to figure out how to make that go faster a little bit to like keep up with the, the, the expected generation time of those reports. And to do that, I had to learn like, how does a SQL database work? Like, why are my queries so slow to begin with? Um, and then I had to learn like, okay, now I know why it's slow. How would you make it go fast? And the you would have like a special index structure that would be like a bitmap for every rule. So like every user ID, whether or not they matched this rule or not, you have one bit set. And then you can and and or the bitmaps together extremely fast in order to calculate everybody that matches the, the, all of the rules combined together. Amazon Aurora was doing that, but it was doing it with like an interpreter for SQL that was extremely slow. But if you did it with anding and oring, uh, like UN 64s together, the heart, like the, the hardware would be doing all of the hard work for you. Hmm. So figuring out how to transform that problem into this other problem, I had to learn a lot about how databases work up and down the stack, like what's a columnar database versus a, a row oriented database. So I read a bunch of papers. I watched uh, the lectures for Andy Pavlos, who's a professor at Carnegie Mellon, gives a, a graduate and an undergraduate level database class. And he posts the lectures. Are these the recordings that he did in his bathtub? Yes. <laughs> are, that's a later iteration of the class, yes. But there are, there are earlier ones. As is well that for that. sonic purposes? Why did he do that? <laughs> I think it was a, a COVID thing. Okay. We, okay. At home and he chose to film it in his bathtub. But he did, he's, you know, and since they're back in class and then before then, he was also doing it, you know, in class in front of students, but he would record the lectures and he would post all the, the reading lists for the papers. Um, I think most of the homework assignments were available online too. So I just watched every lecture of that series multiple times until I felt like I got all the content. I read all the papers on the reading list because of, 
you know, this is a, a period over like six months to a year. Can I, can I interject just wondering how did you manage that learning process with the expectation of, Hey, I don't know if you're doing scrum based execution at work, how did you convince your manager that hey, I'm going to work on this and it might take me six months to, that just doesn't seem like it would fly. Maybe you're doing like micro deliverables along the way, but how did you figure out how to do that learning on the job? So the actual problem I ended up solving relatively quickly, at least getting a version of it that was passable enough to mm -hmm. run in production, I think that was like less than a month. And I had other stuff that I was doing at the time that I could, you know, pepper in along the way. I was still working on like the front end performance optimization and stuff like that. Um, but at, like it was really after that task where like I got hooked on figuring out how to do it where I kept going. Um, I learned just enough to solve the problem at the time, but then after that, I was like, oh, I like this stuff, so I should yeah. keep going. Um, but were you doing that like in your own time, like waking up early, doing it before work or whatever, or are you doing it at work? Like uh, what was your, what was your um, I, I was a little bit of both. Like sometimes the stuff would be relevant for work and I would justify doing it at work. Sometimes it would be, you know, completely irrelevant. And I, yeah, I did a little bit of, a little bit of both. And that like, once you get started on databases in general, like the end game of that is, as you described, you have to understand everything about all of the abstractions. So like you, you will eventually end up learning about essentially all of computer science. Um, and, you know, you're at least touching some part of, of every bit of it. Like now I know way, way more about file systems than I ever expected to, to know about file systems. And like in an introductory class, in an introductory operating systems class, I imagine they go over file systems maybe for like a lecture or two, but like you can go way deeper than that uh, if you're if you're studying it on your own and you're giving yourself a little bit more time and you read recent research rather than like research from 40 years ago that was condensed into a textbook. Yeah, I feel like for something like that, like I do teach file systems. I do teach it in a single class. I, I at the end of the class, apologize for like the summary treatment um but i and you know and i try and give hints of like what might be interesting for people if they want to pull the thread um but i feel like for a lot of people that's the amount of appetite they have for file system implementations uh like without some other kind of motivating example whereas people who've experienced data loss or something where they're like they they thought that they were running a journaling file system and that it was all in the journal and then like the power went off and they lost data or something and uh like they had a team meeting about it one experience like that and they're like i gotta understand this i th i thought it worked like this it doesn't i've got to i've got to do something else and then there are some people who i don't understand why they're hooked they just get obsessed about their particular file system or like some some version of some file system and they go, that's just their hobby, I guess, and we all need one. But uh, I, I feel like if you <laughs> if you have an excuse, if you've got like a motivating reason to dive into file systems, it's so it's so rich. But maybe that's the same of uh, of all these topics, right? Like maybe you just had a kind of formative experience of like your database problem that led you down the databases path, and we just like all need to keep our eyes open for such experiences at work. You should uh, you should just start corrupting your students file systems and then uh they'll pay more attention us. yeah um, well i also think the uh just even the idea that you can learn everything you need to know about any subject in the four or so years of university seems completely absurd to me i know i learned a lot of other things that were outside like half more than half of my time at college that i remember is outside the classroom i was a history major um but you know even if i was focusing on computer science there's no way that you'll learn everything even doctors have to go to continuing education and things like that. And if I can preach for the boot camp grads or non-traditional grads, if you've gone through one of those programs, you're coming later in life, you're sort of raising your hand and saying, I want to learn this. And if those things do anything, it's teaching you how to figure these problems out and how to find these kernels and then seek them out. So uh, yeah, go boot camp grads. I think, uh, I think they're potentially more amenable to being curious is my... But yeah, I still don't know how much of that is like maybe maybe both Ryan and Richie would have opinions on that. How much of that is like individual variation where some people are just drawn to keep like pulling on that thread 
and others aren't, or whether it's like a, a, a developed habit or a teachable habit. Like I really don't, no offense to the boot camps, but I don't think in the period of time that they have, they really convert people from being like non-curious to curious. Mm. Do you think do you think it's just an innate thing? Like so many people ignore bugs in there that show up in their logs, right? And some people are like, I absolutely need to figure this out. I think I'm curious what you think, Ryan, because I think part of it for me was like, I don't know if it was chicken or egg, because I know I knew I was really bored and I knew I wanted to work on more stuff where I could apply these concepts. And so I forced myself into an environment where I was working with people who dealt with this stuff every day. And then once you're in that area, I mean, it's like, there's reasons to, like, it's immediately applicable. You know what I mean? Like, if you go, like, I could go read a garbage collection textbook and it was immediately applicable, applicable to my job, understanding like the memory hierarchy and how that impacts your data structures and how that'll impact application performance is like immediately applicable to my job. Like, knowing how the file system works and that like, if you use the file system as a database, you're eventually going to have problems. Um, like a lot of systems do, like is immediately applicable. Um, so I, I don't know if it's some, um, which one comes first, but I, I definitely feel like when you're in an environment where like, if you can go read a paper and it doesn't feel like completely irrelevant to your day job, um, that is, I think that helps. Mm. Uh, but I don't know, You, I mean, you weren't, you tell me. Yeah, I I think that I've been generally interested in performance optimization stuff for a long time, like regardless of what the job was. So I guess that part of it was probably innate, but the gravit like performance, there's performance everywhere. And like you can make an iPhone app, like the, the scrolling be really smooth. And like you can, there's all kinds of different dimensions to performance optimization that don't necessarily involve like distributed systems or even uh, needing to know what an operating system is. Like you can make things go faster up and down the stack. But I think the um, the the part that I agree with what the Corchi said is that once you're in an environment where these types of things matter, there's like a self-reinforcing feedback loop of if you screw it up, you will get paged. And then that'll be really annoying and you have to go fix it. That makes sure that you, um, like there's real pain associated with getting it wrong. So you have an incentive to go make sure that even the, the one in a million, one in a billion type scenarios work well. Um, that's, I mean, that's how I, we bonded over Foundation UV in the beginning. Cause I used every known distributed database known to man at Uber and just had horror stories from all of them and just like how hard it was to write systems when you didn't have access to like serializable transactions or stuff. Um, and I mean, I think probably a, like the first one year of Ryan and I's relationship was us just like geeking out over Foundation UB um, and how it seemed to solve like so many problems that we've been like exposed to during our career um yeah if the if the uh people watching this don't know what foundation db is it's a key value store database that has serializable acid transactions and it scales to you know dozens to maybe a hundred machines it's not like an infinitely scalable database but it's far much farther than most people would ever need and um, they spent a kind of an absurd amount of time making sure that everything about the database was as correct as it could possibly be by first writing a simulation operating system, essentially, for the database to run on top of that they could inject faults into deterministically into like the file system layer, the networking layer, and the, the thread scheduler. And once they had debugged the correctness of that, like the simulation of the database, they actually started to make like the real hardware, you know, thing that would run on real hardware, um, which even today, there aren't very many systems that work anywhere close. Like they don't have anywhere close to that level of, of testing. Mm -hmm. uh, 
so that was the the thing that was most exciting about foundation db because it's if you're a user of a database writing a correct program that uses the database is um, that alone is challenging but when your database itself has bugs you're like all bets are off like you can't you really you don't know whether or not it's and your bug problem. just like really loose guarantees yeah right? yeah like, bugs or just guarantees that are essentially meaningless like yeah. um some people talk like people talk about what eventual consistency is but there's uh working with a system that's like built on top of a database that is eventually consistent is extremely challenging to debug because you'll never know whether or not it was a bug in your software. Mm -hmm. It's some eventual consistency artifact that may resolve later or may not resolve later. Like it's just, it's, it's really tough. So when you, when we built um, Husky at, at Datadog, we used foundation DB for the metadata storage for that system. And, you know, it's not like we never wrote bugs. We did write bugs, but we were pretty confident that it, they were our problem and not our database's problem. Whereas if we had done it on top of like Cassandra or something, it would have been a completely different uh, adventure. We would have, a lot of the times we probably would have never known where the, where the bug was, whether it was us or Cassandra. I feel like eventual consistency as a term was one of the most outrageous, like uh, marketed terms in computer history it's like people are talking about eventual consistency as if it was a feature and everyone like in the really systems community is like this is no consistency it's making no guarantees whatsoever like if rights stop when are rights going to stop it will eventually not with any kind of time bound but at some point in the future reach mm -hmm. consistency it's like best effort consistency or some effort consistency it and yet was, people are like, oh, I'm with, I'm, we're switching to this eventual consistency system because it's. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a trade-off. You know what I mean? It's like, I, I almost lost it one time. I got an email from an internal team uh, that was talking about how they had a new offering and they put eventual consistency in the features section. And I was like, it's not a secret. <laughs> no one wants that. It's like a, it's a limitation, you know, or. A trade-off that sometimes makes sense, but it's not like it's not a goal, you know. It's just outrageous that they didn't call it like the high availability or something, right? It's like yeah. why why talk about the the thing that's the worst about it as if it's a feature. Anyway. Branding, branding. So there, there's some. <laughs> Speaking of, I'm curious. It seems like both of you, and certainly Richie, you've been able to articulate your work in these technical blog posts, which are then available on the various companies' websites and. I think that's really cool because that's a reference point. Because if you just, you know, you can put anything you want on your LinkedIn, you can put anything you want on your resume. Yet here's this sort of verifiable thing. Potentially that's useful. I don't know if you're trying to start a company, but certainly you're trying to get a next job. Um, was that deliberate? Did that Does that happen by accident? Talk to me about that. I mean, it's deliberate in the sense that I, I like to talk about my work, um, especially because I like work really hard to try and work on cool stuff. Like I've done that, you know, my entire career to always be trying to um, be learning and working on high scale things and, and stuff like that. Um, I don't know. I think it's like, it's really important that you figure out how to sell your work, I guess. And I don't mean that in like a bad way. It's just like, you have to, if you're working on stuff that's important or impactful, you have to be able to explain why and how. Um, otherwise, you just like you won't get the opportunity to go to the next level of higher, more impactful things, right? Like if you can't even explain to someone why the last thing you did was important or interesting, mm -hmm. like you're not going to get the opportunity to do the next higher level thing that's more impactful or more interesting, right? So it's if you if you want those opportunities, you have to figure out how to explain your work um, in the right way. Um, and I also, I mean, part of it too is just like uh, Husky was a really cool system. Like I wanted to talk about it. Um, I wanted, you know, part of it too is like I wanted to help Datadog's engineering brand. Same thing with Uber, right? Like I think Datadog didn't really have a big, um, I and mean, they have an engineering blog, but it's not as like consistent or like well-known. Like Cloudflare has like a really well-known engineering blog. Um, some of these other companies like, uh, uh, and 
that type of stuff helps a lot with like recruiting and being able to get, um, you know, really like people who are excited about the type of pro project you're trying to work on to come work at your company. So it's, it's a bit of that. Um, so it's kind of a win-win for everyone, right? Like you get, you show people that you're working on interesting stuff. It becomes easier to recruit people. Um, I mean, you end up meeting people who are working on similar stuff and they tell you what worked for them. There's like just tons of, I've never had any negative outcomes basically for like sharing my work or, or talking about it. Um, so, um, and you know, Datadog was doing, it's a very product focused company, but they have a ton of really interesting engineering problems. Um, and so, you know, being able to show some of the cool work that was going on there, it was, yeah, I mean, it was just a huge win. Um, so it's, it's both, it's, it's, I don't think anyone ever really loses when you share that type of stuff. Um, plus, I don't know, Speaking of recruiting, I'm, I'm, acronyms and whatever. Um, it's always, you know, kind of interesting to see how people react to it. Spe speaking of recruiting, you guys are recruiting. You know, you've made your first hire and uh, will hire many more people. Very curious to hear about how you think about people's backgrounds, like how, how you think about recruiting and like how you'd assess what somebody has done, what somebody's potential is, like, how are you guys thinking about that? Yeah, um, man, I'll, okay, I'll tell you how we hired Arats, because it's an interesting story. Um, I don't want to put him on blast, but, um, you know, he, he's been great. Uh, uh, but the way we found Arats was at an open source repo that I've written. Um, and, you know, it did some, it's a weird thing, it uses WebAssembly and stuff. It's just kind of like this side project I had where I was trying to learn about, like, actor systems and web assembly. And so I just kind of shoved it all together into one project. Um, it's based on like the, there's a paper called Orleans, came out of like Microsoft about like virtual actor systems. Um, and I don't know, I was in some Slack channel asking for help on web assembly stuff. I think it was like the Gopher Slack channel. Um, and there's this really cool project called Wazero where they've written a pure web assembly, they've written a web assembly runtime in pure Go. So you can like, the way it works is cool. is like you you compile WebAssembly to like your web, your program to WebAssembly bytecode. And then it like M maps into mem, M maps it into M memory and then just like jumps into an interpreter and starts executing it. Um, so anyways, I was talking to people in there asking for help, found this other project um, and uh, called Wetware. Um, and Arats was working on that at the time and he saw my project, thought it was interesting. And he just started contributing to it. Um, and he just did that for months. Like he was just like contributing to my project. I was doing code reviews. I think at the time he was working, he was in Mexico, right? I think so. Yeah, I think he was either in Mexico or Spain. Yeah, he was in he was in Mexico working for remotely for a blockchain company, working on like pretty interesting stuff, but you know, he wasn't like super, super excited about it. And for them, this was like a uh a fun way to like learn about some new distributed system stuff. He has a master's in distributed systems. Um, he just worked on it for months and um, here and there sending me PRs to do detailed reviews and stuff. And, um, you know, when we came to like make our first hire, I remember just being like, man, this Arats guy is like really good. Um, and I already have like, you know, a relationship with him. I already done all his code reviews and stuff. And so we just kind of made him an offer would we meet with him one time on Zoom for like 30 minutes and we're like <laughs> yeah, it was pretty short act like yeah yeah we 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 only met him in person during his like months later yeah, yeah much later yeah. and yeah we had a pretty short Zoom call with him but we we got to basically see the quality of his work for a little while before we made him the offer and that's something that's interesting about open source where you can, obviously it's unpaid, but it's one of the few opportunities you have to actually demonstrate that you can write code to people in a, you know, environment outside of like something that you could show to other people that are not just other people at the current company that you work for. Um, he was obviously not looking for a job though, right? Cause it's like, he wouldn't have even knowing that you were wasn't, no he wasn't looking for like he wasn't on the market or anything um and that's the other thing too i don't want to say like the solution is to go you know work on people's open source projects yeah, for months that it's not <laughs> the, i think the point was just that like 
he, and he was, you know, he was pretty fresh out of his master program, didn't have like that much industry experience. We've been planning on hiring some are like in our head. We're like, we want a distributed systems person with like 10 years of experience. Like that should be our first engineering hire, you know, because uh, we're like, how many, we don't have time to like mentor a junior or whatever, you know. Um, but Arats was just like, he's just so enthusiastic. He was like so hardworking. Like every time I made a side comment about something he didn't know, He'd go and like read a bag about it and come back to me the next day with like eight questions. And, you know, every time I left a comment in a code review, he'd be like, you know, he'd go, th he'd go through like the five whys, basically trying to really understand, like, you know, I would be leaving comments based on my experience, but he wanted to get to the heart of like why. Right. And so I think, you know, it's when you, when you meet someone who's like that kind of, in, when you meet someone who's that like enthusiastic and like hungry to learn, like you just can't help but be like, it doesn't matter what you ask that person to do. They will be successful because they're just that driven and they don't know they'll figure it out. Right. Um, yeah. So. Weird. I, my Funny, takeaway Richie, is, you'll... my, my dumb you takeaway, I have a dumb takeaway, which is like weird, cool shit can happen. If you explore your cre like creativity, it doesn't mean yeah. it will happen, but if he wasn't doing that, this never would have happened. So yeah. Uh, it's like do weird cool shit is my takeaway and then you know that alone is probably satisfying but then because of that new things will come about new areas to explore potential opportunities i don't think people realize like how how safe it is in software to just go down whatever rabbit hole you feel like it's like if you are into music or something that's a bad idea maybe like to be employable as a musician maybe you've got to like fit people's expectations really well like most fields are probably like that you know you, you're interested in medicine or something you can't just like take some weird tangent or even in science these days like you, you need to write the kind of you need to do the kind of research that's going to get published but in computing you can do almost anything whatsoever that you find that you find interesting and there's going to be some incidental benefit that's like at least at this at this point in time valuable enough to somebody that you're going to be like not just employable but probably well remunerated like the people who go down the craziest paths end up having these like insanely valuable skills it's like I, I don't think people realize that and they think oh i need i need to learn the thing for which people are most interested i need to go and learn kubernetes right now because everyone's talking about kubernetes it's like no if you don't find that if you find it interesting fantastic like it, things going to be easy for you if you do not like find something else that is interesting and go down that path and it's all going to work out fine don't you think guys like it's like i mean yeah. and for you guys finding distributed systems interesting like that is kind of the easier <laughs> the easier way through but like there are going to be people who don't and you know want to like dive deep into low level stuff or graphics or whatever and uh, they can just pull on that thread and that's going to be fine too right yeah and i think part of it too is like it's just it's just like exposure you know what i mean like you know if you let's say you go you get your job you, you know you work there for 2 years maybe for 2 years you saw one code base and you got code reviews from like seven people you know what i mean on average but with arats he was like in the span of 6 months I, mean, I don't want to say like he had two jobs because he was just working on this on the side, but it was like it's a whole new novel code base that he was exposed to, a whole new novel way of doing things that he was exposed to. Um, he got code reviews from me. I have a completely different perspective than the people he works with, right? Got to ask me a bunch of questions about distributed systems and my career and, and stuff like that. So it's just like, even just like the raw exposure to like more people, more code bases, more ideas, right? That's like hugely valuable, I think. Um, compresses your career you know what i mean like you just get there you get experience faster basically yeah figuring out how to take like open an existing code base and an editor and like know where the stuff is that is important and how to get there is an extremely useful skill like being able to not necessarily because you're going to be productive at your first day on the job but like being able to know like from the program starting to the program exiting like what are, what's the important path through this program mm -hmm. where like the value is created like why somebody created this program in the first place that's an extremely useful skill that in open source 
you could do every day if you wanted to. Like you could just go open a new random code base and figure out how it worked. Um, same thing. For that reminds me of interviewing people and like we'd have people who they could like whiteboard an algorithms problem. And so we'd invite them in for an onsite and then they couldn't execute a small piece of code because our next problem was like, you know, write something, some small thing and have it run. And these people would like, they've worked on very large, typically Java code, but maybe it's something about Java. Like th they can go into a large code base and make a small change. They can talk about things in pseudocode, but they can't write 10 lines of Java and even know how to execute that. To me, that was astounding. Like after, and these were experienced people to so like not have familiarity enough with just like the basic execution environment that they could like, you know, do the hello world plus in Java, just kind of outrageous. But um, yeah, I feel like being in that kind of a constrained environment of like one job, one employer, build tools, like systems in place for doing things for you. Maybe that's the right way to do things for the company, like the kind of job specialization thing. But, um, you know, for someone who just like wants to understand how to do things and like be, be adaptable to different scenarios. So like, the open source or even just like doing your own projects like be a forcing function for getting outside of the like the setup that these companies have for you it's it's so fun to just like this is my project and i'm just gonna code it however i want and use whatever i feel like and just like this is how i like the style of my code you know what i mean i'm just not like it's i don't know i find that sometimes just so like i don't want to use the word like relaxing but it's just like it's kind of like a rush that you just don't get that often in your professional career. Like it's very rare that you're like open an empty text editor and start mm -hmm. writing a new thing and you get to make all the decisions with no compromises. Right. And like, if you're a, you know, if you're a doctor or an architect or like, you don't get to do that. Right. No one's like, ah, you know, I'm trying this new experimental procedure this morning. And like, I don't care what the patient says, right. Like, it's not a thing you get to do, but it's the, it costs nothing to write software for yourself like it's free um and you should like you just i don't know you just learn so much like we're not doing web assembly stuff like right now but even just like the month or two i was playing around with web assembly stuff i feel like i learned a lot um that i think is significantly added to my like context basically as a software engineer and like I don't know. Now when I see people talking, I feel like to a lot of people, even for me for a long time, WebAssembly like, was ah, it's this weird thing. I don't know what people, people are excited about it, but like in my head, it was like crypto, you know, I was like, ah, it's just like buzzword. I don't really know what it's for, but like now I like, I understand what it is, how it's useful, how the interpreters work, like in what context it could be valuable, where it could end up going. And like, to me, that's like helped me navigate some things, I think. Um, and, you know, you do that 10, 20 times in your career, it compounds significantly. Um, so. There's always some piece of anxiety, at least I feel this way, about some new thing that I don't know. And it's like, I'm like, these people are just gatekeeping me out of this. And they're not, they're just often using helpful terms to describe things that I just don't happen to know at this time. So if you permit yourself to do that, like one to two levels down of ex exploring, you even if you're not going to use it, at least I'm not going to feel anxious about this thing that I don't know about. So yeah, I try to do that. And this is also making me think of like other big company things that give me anxiety sometimes. Like I'm at Cruise right now. We've got a lot of awesome infrastructure. I can go to some website and like click some button to spin up a, a cluster that's been bootstrapped with like everything I need to run an app and I can attach a database and all this and boom, 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 I'm ready to go. That's awesome. I've done that a couple of times. When was the last time I did that from scratch? What if I had to do that from scratch? Do I remember how to do that from scratch? Probably not. Uh, and that's like one of those areas where it's super nice, but if I was on a desert island with a computer and an internet connection, uh, I potentially would be concerned about how to do that. So maybe from time to time, I need to dip in and like do things from scratch a little bit to you know make sure that I don't lose anything, or at least I don't feel scared about some level of uh, abstraction that feels almost too too much like magic. I had a pretty rude awakening about that recently with Warpstream where, you know, I've been writing software that runs in like AWS, GCP, and Azure for like five years. And I was like, I 
I know all about the cloud. You know, I write cloud databases, blah, blah, blah. And then we were, you know, setting up Warp Stream and getting started. And I was like, wow, I know how the Datadog abstractions work. I actually know nothing about cloud networking, like the low level primitives of like setting up a VPC from scratch and figuring out all the security policies and like making sure that, you know, making sure that, you know, staging and production can never touch and auto scaling groups and all this type of stuff um, that I was like, wow, I actually have never actually had to interact with that stuff raw. Cause like for your side projects, you're like, oh, give me an EC2, you know, SCP might build up there and, you know, just listen on a raw port or whatever. And you can't do that with a real company. Um, and so, yeah, I remember like, I like had to do that recently where it's like, oh, well, I don't actually know how this stuff works. And I had to go and like learn exactly how all these cloud primitives are and how you configure them properly and, and all that type of stuff. So, uh, but I mean, that's also just, just life, right? At some point you have to work with abstractions, otherwise you'll never get anything done. Um, so you don't have to feel bad about it. It does feel good to go and, and learn what's at the bottom. Yeah. Speaking of learning what's at the bottom, Charlie, I didn't realize we were doing product placement. You've got the uh, Turing tumble behind you. Wait, what's yeah, this? I'm trying to hide. Have they paid us for this? Not yet, but I'd love to. Have you Have you guys seen this game before? Now I really feel like I'm doing product placement. Have you seen this on Kickstarter? It was one of the biggest Kickstarters, I don't know, a couple of years ago. But you can make logic gates out of these little, uh, these little, I don't know, kerplunk style things going down. I I've set it up a couple of times, and like one of them, it represents like a latch and things like that. Problem is, if you make a mistake, the the balls just scatter everywhere. But my hope is that I like magnetic, gotta... like it's not electric. No, it, no, you like literally a, no, it falls a, with gravity. It falls with oh, gravity, okay. and then you've got these balls up here that you can like press a button and it can go all at once oh, or all okay. at a time. And you're trying to solve these puzzles. And I'm hoping this will allow me to learn uh, low level, low level logic gates and like build, you basically build up a CPU by the last puzzle, I think. Fun. Yeah, it's fun. It just gets everywhere if you knock it over. But I'm also just trying to hide random crap back here. It's it's a little uh, less messy than, I've seen people uh, teach physical logic gates with water-based gates. It's like if you got water coming and water coming, it collides and like goes down. That's pretty messy. I've also seen people teach it with dominoes. And uh, actually, you can look up on YouTube like a four-bit adder with dominoes or something. It's a pretty substantial setup to make like even a four-bit adder with dominoes. Uh, it's a project and, you know, you knock them down. So all these things are good for building building intuition. But I think Turing tumbles may be a little bit messy. Yeah. Uh, Shenzhen IO actually um the best one the best the uh, game for this would be um uh, Silicon Zeros one of my favorite games I'm sure I mentioned it it's a good game can have I go guys, Richie Ryan have you played Silicon Zeros? that's a video game you can get that on Steam it's pretty sweet um so if you're looking to if you're looking to do more coding uh in your downtime I know you probably don't have a lot I have a question that's way above logic gates. Your website is really sick. Who did that? Did you like which of you is like a sick front end engineer? Secret. Oh, the, the, the marketing. The marketing website. Yeah, or even you know the land. Even the <laughs> <laughs> admin console is really ugly. Uh, we hired a designer. Um, I mean, I can give him a shout. His name's Zachary Hayes. He's okay. Very, um, he's funny actually. It's like okay, so here's another example of weird example of putting yourself out there. We found him because he posted something on Hacker News about how he does contracting and how, I don't know, it was some weird comment. I don't know why he, he wrote it. I can't remember the details, but like, I like thought it was an interesting comment, went and found him, found his portfolio. Um, and his portfolio is really interesting. It's all like, it all looks really good, but I feel like he has this like weird take on things where all his websites look kind of unique. Mm -hmm. uh, so Ryan and I were like, let's just hire this guy. Um, okay. I, I'm just glad one of you is not also a secret front end yeah. wizard. Cause I was just, I'm just going to give up at that point. Um, okay uh, you i won't i tried to make the first marketing website and it was very like even though i use webflow it was very 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 bad so we're like we need to special yeah cool well uh i feel like i have learned a lot about how to potentially find uh, employment at uh, a cool company via open source stuff but you know no guarantees but i'm also going to be on the lookout for uh, that potential co-founder uh, at, at the workplace. I'm again, and I'm just sad that no one's 
no one's tapped my shoulder yet, but there's there's still time. Someone watching uh, the podcast will eventually. I heard Ryan first time I met Ryan. I heard him on a podcast, so you know you nice. put yourself. Great, love it. Uh, well, thank you, thank you guys for coming on. Uh, best of luck. I uh, I really appreciate it, and hopefully we can catch up again soon. Yeah, thanks for having us on. Okay. Bye bye, guys. <laughs>